This video will illustrate the technique of using a truth tree to say if an argument is valid or invalid. Now before we look at the tree method, let's take a look at something that you're probably familiar with, a truth table. Here's a table for an argument. The argument has three premises and a conclusion, and the table has been constructed, and now you can read right off of this table if the argument's valid or invalid. What's the name of the row that you're looking for? You're looking to see if you can find a counterexample. Of course, a counterexample is a violation of the definition of validity. We all know and love the definition of validity, right? It says an argument is valid if and only if, if all the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. So you're looking for a row that makes all the premises true and then at the same time makes the conclusion false. Does such a row exist? Yes, it does. Here on the fifth row, we find a counterexample. If you find one, you should circle it. And if you find a counterexample, what does that mean about the argument? Well, a counterexample means that the argument is invalid. If there is no counterexample, the argument's valid. So using the table method is in some ways very, very simple. On the other hand, the tables have some drawbacks. This argument had just three sentence letters, and yet it needed eight rows. If you have four sentence letters, then you have to have 16 rows, five sentence letters, 32 rows, etc., etc. The truth tree method is much more efficient. Typically, it doesn't matter how many sentence letters you've got. The tree is, generally speaking, pretty manageable. So the tree method offers some advantages over the table method. The tree method, however, also focuses on counterexamples. Validity is about preserving truth. If you start with truth and go to falsity, that's always a bad thing for an argument. When we're constructing a tree, we are going to hone in on the counterexample. So in fact, to construct a table for this argument, let me get the definition out of the way, and let's just begin with our setup. We're going to do a tree for this very same argument, and the first step is to set up the counterexample. Basically, that means take all of the premises and stack them one above the other. So B arrow C, D wedge C, and then B double arrow tilde D. And then also take the conclusion and put it in this stack. But we want this to correspond to the counterexample for the argument. In other words, we want to start with the counterexample. A counterexample, of course, would make all the premises true and the conclusion false. Well, just listing the premises is making them true. What do we have to do to make the conclusion false? Well, quite simply, we should negate it. In this case, we can negate it merely by adding a tilde. I now would want to put a line underneath this to say, well, here is my setup for the tree. You might call this the trunk of the tree. It's all premises true and conclusion false. It is the counterexample for the argument. At this point, there's one more piece of information I'd like to point out before I get rid of the table. When we found the counterexample, it's on the fifth row, and that fifth row gives us a little bit more information. It gives us an assignment of values for the individual sentence letters. We got the counterexample, when B was assigned true, C was assigned true, and D was assigned false. This assignment of values can also be read off of a tree. So I'm going to leave the information up here in the corner, and when we construct the tree for this argument, we'll see that we can find the same information on the tree. Okay, at this point, let's go ahead and get rid of the table and all this information. Right? I also don't need these truth values. This was just to point out that this is the counterexample. 
I just paused for a moment and uh, I rewrote the conclusion to make it a little neater. But we're now ready to begin constructing our tree. I'm going to write the steps of the tree method off to the side here. And we've actually completed the first step. The first step was to set up the counterexample. We made all the premises true and the conclusion false. What the tree is going to do is to check to see if the counterexample actually makes sense. When you construct a tree, you're always checking to see if the setup makes sense. If the counterexample makes sense, what would that say about the argument? Well, if the counterexample makes sense, then the counterexample exists and the tree is invalid. If the counterexample doesn't make sense, then it doesn't exist, and so the argument is valid. But let's see how this works. The second step of the method is to start applying tree rules. You can't do anything in logic without a set of rules, and they've been sitting here over by the side. Now we should make use of them. Basically, what we're going to do in a tree is decompose every formula into the elements that would make the formula true. Now notice when we apply rules, it suggests that you do stacking rules first. This isn't actually essential, but it really is, it's a, it's a, it will make your trees much neater and it will avoid them sort of exploding into messy looking bushes. I think it's important to start with the ampersand rule and the wedge rule and to compare these two things. Notice what the rules are doing is decomposing the formula in the ways that will make it true. If you think about a table, when is the ampersand true? It's only true when both parts are true. So there's only one way to make the ampersand true, to make P true and to make Q true. I call this a stacking rule. Obviously, if you've done any proofs, you recognize it as ampersand out, and the reason it works the way it does is because the only way to make this true is to make both parts true. But contrast that with a wedge. There are two different ways to make the wedge true. You could make P true or you could make Q true. You might say, well, there's a third way, right? Make them both true? Well, that's basically exploring both sides of this at the same time. Notice that a wedge really is an upside down branch. That's why logic textbooks like wedges, because it's, it represents the options of going these two different directions. Ampersands are stacking rules. Wedges are branching rules. Every rule that has a branch in it is a branching rule. All the others are stacking rules. What we want to do is look at our, each of our connectives and we want to apply the stacking rules first. So here's an arrow as the main connective. What's the rule for an arrow? Well, that's a branching rule. So let's hold off on the arrow if we can. Second line has a wedge. Well, wedges just are branches, so that would also be branching. What about the double arrow? Well, you go down here and you see the double arrow also includes a branch, so it's a branching rule. It also, it's a, the double arrow is a kind of an interesting combination of branching and stacking, but if it has a branch in it, it's a branching rule. And then finally we get to two tildes. The rule for two tildes, well obviously this is stacking because there's no branch, and clearly this is really just double negation. So this is where we should start. Let's put a, a number out in front and number this step one. And this is a way of checking off this line. And at the same time, it would allow us to go back and reconstruct our work if we want to. So that's all it is. Just drop the two tildes, rewrite the line. But notice we've just exposed another connective. Now, we have to work on every single connective before we're done, and so let's take a look at the rule for the ampersand. Ah, as we just discussed, that's stacking, so this is really an appropriate place to go next. Let's call this 2, and let's just apply the rule. Just break up the line and stack the parts underneath it. At this point, there's three places left for us to work. We've already looked, and these are all branching rules. Well, it really doesn't matter which one we work on next. My default is always to work from the top down, so 
Since it doesn't matter where I work, I'll just go ahead and work on the top thing first. This is an arrow. An arrow is a branch, and so if you know you're going to branch, just start and make a branch. It's typically a good idea to make especially your first branch wide. Go ahead and take some space and spread out. And so over here on this side, it says, make the P part false. And then on the other side, just list the Q part. This can be a rather intuit unintuitive rule. It turns out that P arrow Q is logically equivalent to tilde P wedge Q. So basically, when we're applying this rule to the arrow, what we're doing is saying, hey, th this arrow is actually equivalent to this wedge, so let's think of the arrow as the wedge, and that means it would give us this branch. At this point, we should talk about the third step, and that is to check for contradictions as you work. Every branch or pathway through the tree is an attempt to make the setup make sense. On this branch, we see that it says B is false, but then we go up a ways and we see that the same branch is saying that B is true. Well, wait, that means this branch is contradicting itself. Contradictions don't make any sense, and so we don't need to consider this branch anymore. Let's put the, an X at the end of it to close the branch we no longer need to explore these possibilities. Is this other branch going to be open or closed? Well, here it says C is true. We follow it up and it says C is true again, but it never says C is false, so it's never contradicting itself. It's still open. At this point, there are two more places for us to work at the top. Just working our way down, I'll call D wedge C step four. It's a branch. Where am I going to apply this branch? Well, I'm only going to apply it underneath the open branches down below. Basic idea is that when you apply a rule, it gets applied on all the open branches that exist below the line you're working on. And there's only one at the moment, so that's where it goes. I'm going to put D on one side, C on the other. And then after every application of a rule, you want to check for contradictions. Is the D branch open or closed? Well, we follow this up. Ah, here's a tilde D. But of course, this tilde D is not by itself. It's part of a larger formula. So it does not cause D to close. D is open. C branch? Well, this branch is getting very redundant, but it does not close. There is no contradiction over here. Okay, so there's only one more place for us to work. This will be step number five. And where am I going to apply this rule? There are two open branches down below, and so I actually need to apply this in both places, here and here. And it'll be the very same thing. Now the rule for the double arrow, it looks kind of complicated, but if you think about the table rules for the double arrow, it makes really good sense. When is a double arrow true on the table? It's true when both parts are true or when both parts are false. It's true when the inputs are the same. So it actually makes great sense. So if you look at this line, we've got B and we have tilde D. On one side, you just write B and tilde D. But on the other side, you write B and tilde D and then you add a tilde to both halves. We do the very same thing underneath C. B and tilde D, and then tilde B, and tilde tilde B. At this point, there is no more work to be done up above. All we have to do is read whether these branches are open or closed. So let's go through and ask. Is the first branch open or closed? Well, here it says D is false. There it says D is true. So yeah, that one is closed. Second branch, tilde tilde D, that's equivalent to D, so that doesn't close. 
In fact, if we wanted to, we could apply another rule to tilde tilde d and drop that and get regular d. But notice we don't actually need to do that because look at tilde b. There's tilde b and up above is b, so this branch closes. You don't have to have a contradiction with the last thing in the branch, and you don't have to have a contradiction with both things. Any single contradiction will cause the branch to close. Next branch. Well, here it says d is false. Do we see any place on the path where d is true? What about this d over here? Does it cause this to close? It does not. This is really important. When you're checking a branch, you want to start at the bottom and then take the most direct route all the way up to the top. When I follow that path, I do, I do not pass D by itself. Of course, I also have to check for B. Do I find tilde B any place along that path? I do not. This tilde B does not cause this B to close any more than this tilde B would cause this B to close. So here is actually an open branch. When you find an open branch, it's best to write the word open underneath it. It's open because it doesn't contradict itself and there's no more work to be done on this branch even if we wanted to. Finally, the last branch. Is it open or closed? Well, here we see B is false, there B is true, and so it is closed. At this point, we can read right off of our construction whether the argument is valid or invalid. It's actually very easy. In fact, the fourth step is to read the answer. And it turns out that if all the branches were closed, then the argument would be valid. If there's even one open branch, the argument would be invalid. Let's talk about why this works. When you close a branch, what you're saying is that the br branch is contradicting itself. If every branch closed, that would mean that every branch contradicted itself. Well, every branch is an attempt to make sense of the setup. If every attempt to make sense of the setup contradicts itself, that means that the setup doesn't make sense. The setup was a counterexample. If the counterexample doesn't make sense, then obviously the argument would be valid. However, an open branch is a successful attempt to make sense of the counterexample. If the counterexample makes sense, then the argument is invalid. I know there's a fair bit of juggling of ideas there. The bottom line is all closed is valid, even one open is invalid. What happens if all the branches are open? Well, that's the same thing as having just one open branch. One good way to think about all of the branches in the tree is that the branches correspond to the rows in the truth table. So for our last point, let's return to this assignment of values that we read off of the table. Notice that in this branch of the tree, we do see a D, a B, and a C. B, C, D. And you'll notice that B doesn't have a tilde in front of it. Well, that just means that B is being assigned true. C doesn't have a tilde in front of it either, so it's true. But D does have a tilde in front of it, so it's false. So we can read right off of this branch the same assignment of values that we read off of the table. Maybe the best news about the tree method is it's not like, well, here's the basic idea. Now there's all sorts of complexity that we can add to this to, to do trees for other arguments. In fact, if you understood this tree, you can use these rules to construct any tree whatsoever. The tree method really is a simple and practical method that you can use to determine if an argument is valid or invalid.